Hi guys, welcome for uh, yet another paper of the week. Uh, so this time I'm hoping we're gonna do the paper slightly quicker than last time. Uh, for the paper of the week I chose a 2006 paper um, that is in many ways was quite inspirational when I was trying to think of some of the ideas of Dogen, trying to understand the sort of literature for Dogen, because um, it describes kind of uh, in, in, in sort of technical way, in a technical way, what we were trying to do originally. Uh, so, um, without further ado, let's have a quick look at the paper. So, the paper is titled "The Code Generation Meta Model for ULF," where and the subtitle is Generating Code for STL and Interfacing with the Runtime Library. Now, I'm going to try not to make too many comments in the beginning and then just get going. So, uh, so models can be used in many stages of many different processes, but in software engineering, the ultimate purpose of modeling is often code generation. Okay, this is quite an important thing. Uh, this is exactly what we're saying with uh, Dogen as well. Key thing here is code generation. In fact, to be honest, I'll probably go as far as saying that highlight really is this bit here. Uh, we really the whole point of modeling for us at the moment is just code generation. While code can be generated from any model, we propose to use an intermediate model that's tailored for code generation instead. Right. So here you can see I'd like to highlight this is green. Um so I think it's probably worthwhile putting a or note a note here as well. Uh so um intermediate model uh instead of creating a meta model that is uh, general and useful for many use cases. Put up the fill mode on. Um, it's best to create a meta model specific for code generation only. This is, of course, because it simplifies greatly the, the role of the meta model. This is the approach we took to Dogen. In order to be able to easily support different target languages, this model should be general enough. In order that to support the whole process, the model has to contain behavioral as well as structural aspects. So here we agree um, in this first part, the model should be general enough, but we disagree with the second part uh, where there's a focus in behavior. Uh, so perhaps you could just put a note here. Uh, so general and behavior. So authors believe that the model should be general in order to support several target languages, but they also uh, wish they agree with but they also think behavior is important, which we disagree. Although um, it would be nice to see exactly what they mean by behavior. Um, the model has to contain behavioral as well as structural aspects. Okay, cool. Um, this paper introduces such a model as well as the ideas behind it. When the model, when the model is to cover several languages, differences occur also in the available library functions. Furthermore, the input languages, e.g. STL, may contain high-level concepts, so okay, here we differ quite, quite dramatically, so the input language for this model is STL, uh, which is a sort of the main specific leg language, um, whereas we are, we are looking elsewhere for this. Uh, may contain high level concepts such as signal routing that are not easily mapped into simple instructions. We propose a runtime library to address both challenges. So, this paper has got some similarities to what we're trying to do, but there's a huge amount of differences as well. Uh, so, um, that's, that's the difficulty with this kind of thing. You just have to figure out which bits is import are important to you and which bits are not. So, um, models in general do not relate to programs at all. Um, 
Okay, interesting statement. However, in software engineering, models do refer to systems and their components, which may be executable code. Ideally, model-driven development, such as embodied in OMG's model-driven architecture, or MDA, eventually leads to code generation. Okay? Our research group has been involved in simulation and modeling for a long time. We have developed site, a compiler, and runtime environment for the specification and description language of the ITU STL. So ITU is a uh, telecommunications uh, sort of standards um, sort of place, and uh, the STL is a language done by these people. So the compiler uses the conventional techniques of a hidden representation of the abstract syntax tree and code generation to C++. Okay. Lately, we proposed an open framework for integrating integrated tools for ITU languages that provisionally called ULFWare. An overview of this architecture can be found on figure one of the following page. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Oversimplifying, let's just catch this bit. Oversimplifying, ULFWare contains a model based compiler for STL. Okay, seems straightforward enough. Um, okay, that was not the right key. Sorry, I think I just closed my org note here. Let's try opening it again. Okay, make sure we got the PDF view. And we do. So, let's start again. Right, where were we? Uh, Oh yes, we were just about to highlight uh, this bit here. Let's also control A H. Uh, the input in this case is parsed, and a model in the STL repository is generated from that. From it that adheres to the STL meta model. Okay, so best way to try to visualize this here is to think that there is an injector uh, in other words there's a sort of an input language that input language conforms to a meta model and we're just uh, reading that input language and parsing it and, and storing it in memory now if you try to understand what that means for our purposes well we have um, a set of models uh, in fact not quite that chap here but this chap here this is a model dedicated to this to, to modeling in abstract terms, these input models. Um, and then we have the for, for the specific inputs that we have, like for example, this case is uh, the DIA meta model. Uh, we have this guy here. And similarly for JSON, we have another model uh, similar to that. So th these, these represent the equivalent of this STL chap here. Um, and we parse this into memory and so the next step is to transform this to a new model in the Java C++ repository adhering to the Java C++ meta model. Finally, code generators turn this model into C++ Java. Now, I think what they're trying to say here is that there is an intermediate model uh, in between STL and the Java C++ meta model. But we will see this in a second. But let's have a look at the architecture. So there's an STL program. We have an STL parser. Of course, you have to understand this is a program rather than just a model. So there will be behavior included here. Interestingly enough, we also have UML model coming in. Um, so we have an STL meta model and then a UML meta model. And both of them belong to a common meta meta model, presumably. And these go into two separate repositories for semantic analysis. Uh, then we have some set of concrete rules for UML and for STL and some set of common rules and eventually we push everything to a Java or C++ repository and uh, so you see here there's a common Java and C++ meta model this is actually an intermediate meta model equivalent to what we call a logical model um, and then we set a generated code that uses some runtime libraries in our world, this is a platform definition model, and uh, we have a couple of generators. So the architecture is not too far from this, really. Uh, finally, the code generator of this model in C++ or Java. This paper shortly introduces the Java C++ meta model, a meta model that is applicable to both Java and C++, and, and that comprises 
structural as well as behavioral aspects. Okay, let's capture this guy here. The requirements for such a meta model, which is geared towards generation, are not obvious. Okay, interesting point. Simple meta models exist with strengths and weaknesses. At the end of the next section, excuse me, we will give a short uh, overview of them. Mostly they are concerned with structural aspects only. There is, however, a need for a meta model to cover all aspects of a programming language. Okay, so I think this is very important. Uh, I think we probably want to do something like uh, highlight this, make it green, try to make it green again. I haven't quite figured out what causes uh, color change around here, but there you go. Eventually it does go green. Um, need for behavior. Um, authors claim that a structural model is uh, uh, structure only model is not sufficient but do not provide additional oh, let's set out the film mode again additional justification and we seem to be typing all over the place uh, you know? Justification for the oh, really not doing well. Justification for the views. Now, why is justification not quite right? Um, then the second part of this paper is concerned with runtime libraries. In Sight, we originally had only one output language and one library. Later, we had the experiment support for Java. In general, for any input languages and M output languages, you need N times M libraries and just as many different compilers code generators. With CJ, MetaModel, as common intermediate, the numbers should ideally decrease to just N transformations and M libraries. Okay, so. I think this is quite a good point. Uh, this is exactly what we're also trying to target on, on uh, Doja. And, uh, we so similarly, um, let's put here, um, so and how exactly should we put this? Um, decreasing, decreasing complexity. By sharing shared meta model. So um, the point they're trying to make here is that um, by having a shared meta model, we decrease the number of what exactly are we saying? We're trying to decrease the number of libraries. Yeah, so we're trying to basically say um, permutations between uh, generators and libraries. Uh, E.g. Uh, instead of creating code generator for each library, for each language, sorry, um, and then requiring a set of PDMs, the platform definition models, for each, uh, we, so it's not very clear why we need n times m, really, if you think about it, we need well, we clearly we're going to need n code generators, right, for any input languages. Um, but you don't necessarily need n times m libraries, really. Um, it's not very clear, actually. Not 
clear what authors think we need n times m uh, libraries but at any rate uh, with with the share meta model we decrease the number of generators required and even that is not very clear really what we're trying to say here is by having a, sh a shared infrastructure Why my um, spell checker is not helping very much? Infrastructure. Uh, but at, at any rate, with shared infrastructure, we um, we can manage to significantly reduce code duplication. And yeah, that's the general idea, really. If you have a code generator that can generate multiple languages, the idea is that you're going to end up only um, much of the infrastructure is shared, and uh, so we, we still need language-specific PDMs. This is just unavoidable, right? You're still going to need some kind of uh, library-specific and language-specific support but at least the code generation infrastructure is shared. So uh, later we added more C++ libraries that support the different needs, so basically they're expanding on the key PDM space. One library for simulation, including model time, stopping of the simulation, inspection variables. Another for exception, execution, sorry. Only speed matters. Also libraries that use different middleware platforms, so they're just expanding their PDM space. These libraries did not require a new code generator as they had the same interface as the old one. <coughs> Generally, adding another library with the same interface does not require any transformations. Therefore, this paper shows why code generation, meta model, and the accompanying libraries are useful and simplify the task of translating STL. So this, thi this bit here uh, is kind of fairly specific to STL. Uh, section 2 will prese present general choices that are to be made in order to determine the shape of the meta model in connection with the runtime library. Section 3 and 5 present the meta model detail. Finally, in section 4, Page 7 describes runtime leverages they are now and how they will be interfacing with the CJMET model in order to simulate the runtime systems. Runtime, the run, simulate or run SCL systems. <coughs> so, design considerations for CJ. The code generation meta model is conceived to be useful to generate C as well as Java from it. Therefore, we name it CJ. Well, that's just basically why we call it CJ. C and Java. Good name. Uh, the meta model. It is advantageous to employ the same meta model for all steps. This is a novel point of view. A conventional compiler might use BNF for the parser, but build his abstracts in such tree using other means, such as Kim, Witu, plus plus, or an ad hoc function. So, what we're saying here is because this is a 2006 paper, these guys here are trying to, to show us that they're moving towards a MD way of looking at things. So, instead of using grammarware, they're thinking of using a proper meta meta model, um, and of course, because this is 2006, uh, MDA and all the, the infrastructure that went with it was uh, quite in fashion, so they obviously went for MOF. So, we have chosen to use MOF as a meta meta model, it is used um, in many OMG standards, uh, MDA, most prominently as the meta model for the UML. MOF is closely tied to UML, in fact, there is a number of packages called UML infrastructure that are shared between MOF and UML. Okay? So I think we will just probably say, fine, you're going along with MOF. Now, of course, we are not going with MOF, but uh, let's get this to be green. Quite figure out what triggers it to change color. Seems to be a bug. You need to change pages. It is useful in many other... Uh, oh sorry, uh, we've gone past this. So MOF, however, is not just a meta-meta model. 
but it provides a metadata management framework. Now, this is very interesting. There are a number of mappings from MOF to different platforms, such as mapping to XML for model interchange and mapping to Java, which gives interfaces to create, navigate, and modify models. So, um, this is XMI and that kind of thing. So, we'll just say, okay, we understand what you're saying. Using MOF and so these days, I guess you would be looking at an EMF for this sort of work. So using MOF and an appropriate tool for it gives a standard way to access models. First, you define a meta model based on the MOF meta meta model. The tool then generates interfaces for models of this meta model and an implementation to store these models. Theref there are a number of tools, but the only adhering to the MOF 2.0 standard is a MOF for Java. Okay. Now we are trying to avoid, of course, the MF and MOF and things like that because... Um, so actually this perhaps is a good point to make here. Uh, so if we go for a meta i... Not is not very happy at present. Let's see if I can put a note here. For some reason, our note is not liking a note, so we'll just do it manually. Um, <coughs> MOF. Uh, the use of a standard meta, meta model uh, provides a lot of tooling and infrastructure and simplifies uh, the work simplifies the work um, we need to justify uh, why we did not build upon uh, this approach so it's important to explain why we, we decided not to go along with MOF and that sort of thing uh, and on that. Um, generic or specific. So high level models are quite different from programs in conventional programming languages. They abstract from most of the detail that a programming language exhibits. Okay, that sounds sensible. I mean it's just a classic thing about uh, models, but uh, uh, okay so now Ognoto is happy again. I'm just going to call this notes MOF and just move the contents of our previous notes into there yeah, I should get this going again um, Once you want to generate real code, all the details has to be filled in so you mean have to be filled in uh, This makes code generation for those models a difficult task Moreover, many uh, decisions in this process are similar for different target languages but it's hard to make use of these commonalities. So really, thi this is really the crux uh, of what we do with the logical model. It's really, really, really almost a perfect description of Dogen's logical model. Um, let's try to change page again and then change color to green. Um, and then let the eye here. Uh, reasons or difficulties um, in generation I guess so uh, authors explain um, the difficulty uh, of the of code generation from abstract models. Uh, we could, uh, we should mention our solution to this problem, which is to capture schematic and repetitive patterns found in code. 
So that's that's it, Professor Dogen. Basically, is um, the, clearly this is a problem, and clearly the guys right, the guys are right. Um, so um, we, we, we too we face the same problem with Dogen, and, and our solution was to try to capture these patterns in the templates and via physical model. Finally, the way back uh, from program to text to high level models is very hard. Okay, this is. Um, Usual problems of round tripping, not the most tools promise to do this. Reverse engineering or Java to UML. Only captured structural aspects of the language. Okay, that's fine. We don't really care about round tripping. The reverse approach is to use models that are very low level and close to the specific language. Again, this is a very bad idea. There have been a number of papers on this, such as implement uh, six implementing this. The meta model obtained this way is very close to the original BNF of the language. There are grammars in disguise. So this this is the problem. I mean, the point of a model is to abstract complexity. If you end up with a model that looks like the language, uh, you're going to end up with something that's not very useful. We tried that in Doge in the beginning and concluded, like everybody else, it's not a good idea. Models like this are difficult to obtain and they'll be the result of uh, model transformation from a level model. Here, the intelligence would have to lie in the transformations. Uh, so this is not a good idea. Um, this level detail of a meta model of a programming language determines whether there will be a um, model or more work to do in the code generator or the model transmitter. So this is the trade-off really. We have to choose um, a level of abstraction that allows true object-oriented models as opposed to models closely related to syntax of a language while still being close enough to programming to make code generation a straightforward process. So in other words, uh, finding the right level which is the model so I'd even go as far as saying this is probably a pink note because what we're saying here is the great difficulty is finding the right level of granularity uh, model granularity is key uh, to finding the right level I, I wouldn't even call it a granularity perhaps uh, model abstraction level. So finding the right level of abstraction at, at which to model is very important. If a model is too close to source code, uh, it is very difficult to handle in terms of transformations. If it's is too far away from source codes uh, the code generation is very hard so this is the problem we debated and faced with Dogen quite a lot in the beginning uh, and we will add another criterion to the decision as to how close the target language to the model should be uh, can we use one metal model for many languages so this is a really good idea, this is a very good point, uh, and this is the thing that we try to do with Dogen. Um, so the criterion they got here is two levels of detail, and can you target more than one language. So commonalities of object-oriented programming languages. So um, authors make a case. So Uh, commonalities for oh. authors make a case for a common model for several oh languages for code generation, which is exactly what we're doing here. So many languages here are common concepts such as uh, the quite abstract concept of namespace. For programming languages, the similarities go even further. Many differences, well, it's interesting the way they put it here, but many differences in those languages are purely syntactical or for simple static semantics, such as the declaration of variables before use. The most important differences are support for crash avoidance and the extent of available libraries, neither of which affects the meta model. So this is very good. There's a lot of commonalities between languages. I mean, if you look at our uh, logical meta model, uh, you can see the abstractions we put here. Now these don't really relate to the UML meta model, uh, in the sense that we didn't choose the same names, 
some of it, some of it is for historical reasons. Some of it is because of, of clashes with C++. But uh, I mean, you should really recognize the key concepts here. So module is a package, and object is a class, and so forth. Um, we probably will rename these these types a little bit um, as we go along, uh, but we settle on them for now, so it's good enough. But the idea basically is that you can see that these patterns are probably common to a lot of programming languages. Um, Java and C++ in particular are very similar to each other. Still, a complete meta model will exhibit a number of fine differences, such as the non-existence of multiple inheritance. However, we want to use Java and C++ as the output languages only. This allows us to build a meta model that can represent only the intersection of features between Java and C++. See, we avoided this by actually focusing on the output that Dogen wants, rather than uh, you know trying to extract the language um, semantics. Sorry, a bit thirsty. Um, so here we could probably say. Oops. Uh, multi language and common denominators. So by supporting multiple languages, the authors decided that only features that are common to all languages are supported in the meta model. Our approach is to uh, our, our approach is to um, have some features supported on some languages but not others. So our approach is slightly different from theirs, but uh, we see what they're trying to do here. So um, since Java and C++ have so much in common, the combined meta model is still expressive enough to allow arbitrarily complex models. Same with us. In fact, other object-oriented languages share the same concepts in very similar ways. Some of the differences between languages are evened out because we, we want to use um, the models only for code generation. In Python, for instance, variables do not have a decoration type. So this is another very good point. The fact that we're using code generation means that, um, and, and in our particular case, the fact we're focusing on the structural aspects, means that we don't really have to worry about every fine detail of the language. The role of a runtime environment. The runtime environment serves two purposes. It hides differences between target languages and facilitates the code generation for complex concepts. Um, okay. While the target languages we consider are semantically similar and exhibit mostly syntactical differences which are easily covered by a code generator, they can have vastly different standard libraries. Right, so uh, let's just have a quick look at what we're doing for time. Okay, half an hour. Um, so now this is where we're entering the role of PDMs, right? Um, the problem is already obvious in a simple hello world program. While C++ uses printf or cout, Java instead uses... So, I see, this is, this is where you start to think too low level, right? Uh, our biggest disagreement here with these auth authors is... Um, Low level approach. Um, authors seem to be concerned with low level language details at code generation level. Um, we believe instead that much of the massaging required can be done at the model to text transformation level. And the role of PDMs is only when missing features or large missing features uh, need to be provided. So of course we have tried to not have PDMs and generate everything, but then the conclusion is that you end up generating lots and lots of very repetitive code. So you do need some kind of platform uh, to, to sort of fix the impotence mismatch between the code that you're trying to generate and the system libraries. But 
uh, things like system print line, uh, print line, so on. This this is not the right level of abstraction for us. Um, one way is to have special meta model uh, elements for print C. We we shouldn't really be thinking about meta model elements at the printing level. Um, so one way is to have special meta model elements for printing text, and similarity, and similarly for all of the other library calls that differ. This also means changes to the meta model if we want to include uh, another call. The other way is to use a common runtime library that offers uniform interface to the model and encapsulate different functionality. Clearly, it's a process superior. Um, our third approach is really to avoid both problems, really. But in theory, code generation can generate code down to the most basic level. So that's really what we're trying to say. Uh, This would have the advantage of a minimal runtime library. The library, this library would be specific to a target language but unconnected to the source language. But as outlined on section 2.2 on page 3, it is preferable not to burden the code generation with too much detail. So now I think it's important for us to say that we s slightly disagree. We can select cross uh, pages. So we just have to select here, select, and select again, and we'll say here um, too much detail uh, as with the right level of modeling, the right level of detail. And the code generator is also uh, engineering trade-off. Uh, we decided to add more detail to the generation in order to keep the meta model simpler, whereas they took the opposite trade-off. Instead, the runtime library contains support for the advanced. So, in, in effect, if you were to think about it, what they're trying to say is they're trying to create a runtime library that makes the two languages look the same. Now, you can imagine this is actually a really hard thing to do, especially if you're using a lot of features of the language. And anyone that's written code generators, as we've had done in the past, knows this is a really hard task to do. So, um, let's just say that um, creating a library to make the different uh, languages look the same has a lot of these uh, advantages. So a uh, lot of codes to maintain um, not non-idiomatic codes that developers of that language will not understand and, and so forth right you can see here that, that there are problems this, this is a trade-off it's very important that it's understood uh, related work there are a number of meta models for different languages around however the public availability of these meta models is limited further the focus of meta models can be quite different as mentioned above there is a project called Genome. <coughs> the meta model developed therein is tailored to a generation generating documentation for Java files. Lacks support for the implementation of methods such and as is as such not suitable for the complete code generation. Fine. Both the NetBeans ID and Eclipse seem to use the Java meta model internally. Both IDs bring their own repository functionality, NetBeans MDR, a MOF 1.4 repository, KPMF. A repository and meta model is similar to MOF. Both meta models are not meta MOF 2.0 meta models and do not cover dynamic aspects. The OMG has specification containing a Java meta model which seems to have been abandoned in the early stages of development. Numerous other works are concerned with automatically generating meta models from grammars. The results are usually close to grammar and naturally specific to language they are based on. They are not suitable for a more general approach. A meta model that captures some Common features of Java and Smalltalk is printed in 9 
This map model is concerned with common refactoring operations of the two languages. Let's have a quick look at 9. Seems like something that we probably have read. So it's because it's refactoring and because refactoring is more to do with the detail rather than structure, we'll give it a miss. Um, there's a condensed view. This is a condensed view of the meta model. For an elaborate description, please refer to 10. Now, 10 might be worthwhile keeping an eye on. So copy the chap and highlight it for good measure. Uh, control C, or Control X, wasn't it? Control. Oh, Control C, Control H. One of the problems with Emacs that I find is after a while of um, uh, muscle memory, uh, it's difficult to actually remember the keys that you're pressing. Um, I'll put this in the general notes, uh, papers to read. Just leave it there, and then at this I know. Um, well, perhaps we probably should just. Well, it might be make more sense to actually just create a references section. So if I just type and say, um, and we just add the references that we think are worthwhile for us. Is that chap here? Okay. Um, Basic building blocks. The basis for the CJ meta model is a number of classes that are not shown in the diagram here. Okay, interesting. They have self explanatory names such as named element and are modeled very closely to the elements of the same name in the ML infrastructure. This class, in fact, these classes can be viewed as stripped down versions of the infrastructure. Okay, so I think another point we should make here um, is. UML infrastructure. Um, whilst the authors claim their meta model is designed for code generation, it seems it's more concerns with um, UML compatibility rather then a close fit to the requirements of the generator. We take the exact opposite approach. Our model is designed specifically to fit the code generation requirements. So we are quite different, very, very different from what they've done here. And this is, I think, a pink, pink annotation, I think, because this is really important. It remains to be seen whether it is advantageous to have them here, um, which aid will aid in understanding the concepts because it is simple, or whether we should rather make use of the structure itself. It's not a problem we have. <coughs> so now we're going to cover the different types of meta model elements. So packages. An important structural concept of Java is package. In C++ there's a concept of namespace. The two concepts are equivalent. The differences in use and usage are of no concern to the meta model of the languages. So in our case, of course, we have the concept of a module, as you can see here. Um, while generating code, care is taken that every generated C++ namespace has an associated header file declaring everything such that the name, that the inclusion is equivalent to the import of a package in Java. So again, we are getting into low-level details of what the sort of what the generator is doing, um, and I don't think this is a good thing. Consequently, a single meta package, meta class package, a special version of namespace, suffices for suffices for both Java packages and C++ namespaces. They will be mapped accordingly 
but C also 3.5 on the next page with an exception. Fine, class. So perhaps what we could probably do. Well, okay, let's just keep going. But I mean, you can clearly see that there's a mapping here between their types and our types. Might be worthwhile creating a mapping here. So if I do something like a CJ type and Doge type comments, something like this. Uh, and then if we just basically say so packages we call this a module um, so low level mapping forcing all of C++ elements to be declared in the same header not really a very good thing in our view. Then we have class in Dogen that maps to a mod an object. Um, uh, so uh, no multiple inheritance. And then um, we have the idea of interfaces. So there is no interfaces at the metamodel level. Now, now interestingly, you have a type of types. So let's just have a look at what type is. Um, so types enables us to map both collections and primitives. And we say that the Dogen approach is not applicable. Uh, we use multiple meta model types for this concept so uh, whilst they have a type of type collection type primitive we don't really have that notion and in reality you have to create an object uh, and then in that object you have to determine whether it's a collection or not um, via some of the parameters that you can do so that's a very different approach um, Primitive types are predefined types in Java and C++, so these are built-ins. At the start, as a start, only integers and booleans are used. The third primitive type here is void, which is used in functions. Again, it's very low level. Uh, there is a constraint on the primitive types that is not expressed formally. There, there may be only one instance of the metamodel element primitive type for each primitive type kind, and there, as to there always has to be exactly one. This means that there will, there will have to be a number of model elements in CJ models that are always supposed to be there, just as package predefined in SDL. So um, you should probably say um, so handling of primitives. CJ uh, expects the existence of a uh, uh, number of core types. Uh, this is not enforced formally. Uh, Dogen sees these as plain model types defined in PDMs uh, and then so built-ins are also are no different from any model type so this is a very different approach um, and it's also interesting that they decided to mention explicit collections but um, that's fine See, this, this I think is really a very telling thing. Um, uniform interfaces to collections, I mean, really, really not ideal. Um, 
So if we just make a comment here. So, um, so CJ's approach of having uniform interfaces to collections is not ideal because we either duplicate duplicate um, the existing standards libraries uh, into a CJ standards library which is not idiomatic as you can imagine um, not well maintained etc uh, or worse uh, we create a small number of simple collections which do not have the required expressive expressivity, I'm not sure that's the right English word, expressive power of a uh, full standard library. And this is the approach I've seen in the past where you start creating types like collection. Uh, which doesn't really have any specific properties, but it's just used because to make code generation easier. Functions and variables. Okay, so this this is really we're going to skim through this bit because, um, to be fair, we don't really do much of that dot gen at present. So, uh, as can be seen in Figure Two on the facing page, both variables and functions are model elements that have a name and a type. Additionally, functions have parameters. Uh, they inherit from parameterized element and the body. Variables can be marked as being constants. This, however, necessitates initial values, and those can be can imply an order for the variables which is not desired. So it has to be complex. Function bodies. So at present, we don't really support this in Dogen. Um, it is not completely clear how to represent the body. It is uh, a nested name. Is it? Is it a nested namespace containing, amongst other things, the local variables? Or is it? Uh, this is very low level. We are now talking about the model that represents a uh, description of function body, which is a very complex thing. Or is it uh, an ordered sequence of statements? The latter approach has the advantage of being simple, but is also very close to the abstract syntax tree and not in the spirit of modeling. So I think this is really key here. Uh, for instance, the collection of variables should just occur in the statement sequence and uh, would not truly live within function namespace. Now, I would like to make a comment here, which is uh, function modeling. Uh, it is very difficult to model functions and I'll say behavior really in general uh, CJ um, so perhaps I should say um, the authors point out problems or challenges should I say we avoid this problem by not modeling operations other than for the purposes of merging for generation which will be added later on so we just avoid all these dif difficulties the trusted representation of the body is heavily influenced by the way that the runtime library is built uh, whilst while the language that we want to generate code for are similar the system libraries are very different. Part of these differences will be covered by the metamodel or by supporting runtime libraries. The requirement of that each function needs a type leads to the need for a type void which has to be explicitly disallowed for variables. So now we have types that are special. Respective constraint is not shown here. The alternative solution, one that has been chosen in our metamodel, is to have the type being optional on a type element which unfortunately is not intuitive at all. So now we get to the PDMs. Um, First we'll have a look at the related work. Automated code generation has become an accepted method in design of new software systems. There is a wide range of code generators available which produce code of a particular programming language from a particular specification or description of language like STL. So clearly there's lots of special code generators, special purpose code generators. 
Most of them use some kind of runtime environment for the generator code for reasons of abstraction, efficiency, and adaptability. Right, so the environments could be realized quite differently. So, most STL code generators use a code library like Telelogic Tau. Some use pre configured code fragments like Syntef Progen, and others use runtime environments in an even broader sense. Usually, each generate each code generator is quite fixed regarding its runtime environment, target language, target platform, and the configuration of the resulting system. Quite an important point. Perhaps green sites. The STL code generator environment once developed in our research group behaves similarly. It is its generated C++ code depends on a runtime library but various efforts have been undertaken to provide more flexibility. It is possible to exchange the library when conforming to its interface, and there is a mechanism to change the code generator output without changing the generator. And additional information could be embedded directly in the STL specification. We perceive the desire to be more flexible to reuse the existing generator for a broader spectrum of application. Runtime library presented in 13 is meant as a contribution to that issue. So a quick look at 13. Not very clear. So that library allows the generated system to be adapted to different communication means to the environment. That is protocols and encodings. Okay, so this is slightly related to telecoms, but we get the gist of it, but restrictions remain. If you want to switch to a target, a different target programming language, even if we close the, if we, if we close the one used, a complete review of the code generator is needed. Possibly even a new code generator. Inevitably, we need a new runtime library too. That is for every desired combination of source and target library, we need one code generator. If you could see the separation of syntactical issues from abstract concepts of the target language will be sufficient to have one abstract transformation per source language. So I think this is a bit of the holy grail of trying to create just one thing for everything. We, we don't really take that approach. So let's talk a little bit more about the runtime library. Elements of the library. One aim of our code generation is simple and readable code. Okay, I guess everyone has got that sort of aim. Uh, another straightforward code generator both aims imply that the runtime library must give extensive support for the concepts of the source language. It has been previously shown, 1 and 3, that this can be achieved by structural equivalence of the source and the target specifications. Alright, so sadly these are German works, so I have to give that a miss, um, but perhaps we should just uh, highlight this bit here. Um, the result can be seen in figure 3 in the next page. The system type S type is transforming to C++ class with the same name that inherits an STL system, a class defined in the library. Likewise, B type is a block type in STL and inherits an SD block in C++. The gate and the channel are simply variables of corresponding C++ type. To this end, the runtime provides classes for STL concepts that the concrete classes the specification inherits. Of the specification inherit. Uh, other elements of the library are not shown here are functions to root signals. So this is something that really, really important for us is that um, generated code must be idiomatic. I mean, we've already mentioned that in the notes app, so uh, interfacing models in the library. In order to use the library effectively, the library interface has to be specified. Often this happens in plain English text. However, to access the library in the model, we need the formal definition of the interface in a package that is part of the model. Just as a set of header files for the C library become part of the program at compile time, okay? In a similar fashion, the package predefined in STL in a similar fashion, as the package predefined in STL, this package is considered to be in every CJ model. This package, however, does not contain any implementations and no code will be generated for it. It is considered to exist in target as well. This is necessary to use references in MOF for specialization function calls, so those are not by name. So uh, this is 
a lot of uh, mixing of the modeling. So what you'd say here probably is something like it's like um, I wouldn't say mm, well. Let's just say pretty fine issues uh, by relying on MOF uh, we start to pull in uh, runtime dependencies to the modeling environment meaning all users of the generative codes are now exposed to uh, modeling implementation so this is something we specifically try to avoid um, furthermore the interface must be consistent for all runtime libraries in the past this resulted in reinforcing the result between differences and resulted and differences between the libraries became apparent the only one problems occurred to define an interface we have yet to decide upon a sanitized model such as IDL or EODL Note that the interface is not limited to function calls, but also includes classes that are used as types for inheritance. Right, okay, now conclusion. The last step in a complete model-driven software engineering process is the generation of implementation artifacts, usually in the form of source code. Okay? While the code can be generated directly from high-level models such as UML, this puts too much work on the code generator. Instead, a stepwise refinement of the model into a model geared towards code generation is preferable. So, this is quite crucial. And this is probably a, a green one. To this end, we have prepared the meta model that is reasonably close to the target languages, Java and C++, while still being general enough to not only cover these two languages, but other object oriented languages as well. This is different from existing meta models that have been published, mainly for Java which are close to the grammar of Java. Thus, they can, be all they can only, they can often hardly be called metamodels as they are no more than a MOF representation of the abstract grammar. This shape metamodel will be used in the framework where C++ is generated from STL specifications. The aim of this open framework is to be extended for other language output languages such as Java Python and other input languages such as UML or domain specific languages. So we are sharing this sort of ambition. In order to execute STL models infrastructure, if needed, they will be included in the form of runtime libraries. This facilitates the code generation by covering the remaining differences between our target languages and providing solutions for complex concepts of the source language, STL. Still more importantly, any infrastructure of a well-defined interface allows to change the runtime library to meet specific new needs. The code generation methods, CJ and its accompanying libraries will be allowed to generate code for and executes or similar CSTL systems. Right, okay. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting a little bit tired of a long week, but uh, I mean, we got the gist of it, really. Uh, this paper, so if I was to summarize the importance of this paper for our purposes, um, they are introducing the notion of creating an, an int intermediate model somewhere in between the generation level, AST, EBNF kind of grammarware representation, and UML, high level representation. This is exactly the approach we're following. Um, they're using a model that's still very close to the language. Our model is slightly more pushing more towards the middle rather than more towards the UML side of things. Um, so this is quite an important approach and we will have to make sure that we cover a lot of what's said in this paper when we discuss our approach. Okay, I think that's going to be all for this paper. Thanks for watching.